Hi everybody, this is Sue Ann Jackson from the State Unit on Aging. I want to welcome everyone to the 2016, 2017 uh, series of webinars. Sorry, um, we're almost to the end of the year, wow. Um, I'm super excited today to have in the room with me Sarah Bristol from Multnomah County and Cindy Susi from APD. And they're going to tell you who they are in just a little bit, but we also have on the phone Jeannie Frederick and Sarah Booth from Providence Elder Place. You guys, are you there? Yes, we are. Okay, mm -hmm. awesome. Okay, so in a couple minutes, I'm going to turn it over to all four of these wonderful ladies. I'm excited to have them talk to us about the PACE program, which is the program of all-inclusive care for the elderly. Um, it's really exciting, and it's going to be... Um, it's going to be you guys are going to get a lot of great information but i want to remind you that we do keep you all on mute um, because we are recording and um, the background noise from the different phones and the computers and the cell phones that people join in on um, definitely affects the recording um, clarity so we are recording it we will post it on our website it usually only takes a few days to get there and we post it with a pdf of the powerpoint Hopefully you guys all got the PowerPoint. We sent them out this morning, I think, um, to those who were registered. If you were not registered um, and you're just joining us now, please, uh, you can email Lori, L-O-R-I dot C dot Watt, W-A-T-T at state dot O-R dot U-S. And in the subject line, just say need webinar materials and she'll send you the PowerPoint. Um, I also want to remind everybody that to watch for an email from Lori shortly after the webinar that will have a survey monkey so you can tell us how we did, um, what, you, what you learned, what we can do differently next time to make it better. So I'll remind you about that at the end. I really, really appreciate these guys being here today. I'm super excited to have them. And I'm just going to turn it over to Susie, to Cindy and Sarah and Jenny and Sarah on the phone. So I'm gonna let maybe these guys here in the room with me can start and then they can pull in Jeannie and the other Sarah. So my name is Cindy Susi and I am the PACE uh, Policy Analyst for Aging and People with Disabilities here at Department of Human Services. And I've actually been in this role now for, um, hard to believe, but two years and still learning and uh, I love it. I love the fact that I, I learn as I go and um, it gives me the opportunity to learn more about this program as well. And so I started uh, actually with the PACE program financials uh, nine years ago. And so I have that kind of background, but I've been able to learn more of the policy over the last couple of years. And my name is Sarah Bristol, and I'm a quality assurance coordinator with Multnomah County. I've been doing that for about four years, and before that, I was a Medicaid case manager. Um, so uh, uh, Multnomah County obviously has um, some of the largest uh, PACE program um, enrollments, so I had to learn very quickly a lot of the, the policy and how to um, operationalize it. So at the end, if you have any uh, Medicaid-related questions um, about PACE, I can definitely help you out with those. And um, I will be watching, this is Sue Ann, I'll be watching the questions so, and you guys in the chat, the text chat, so that if you guys have questions for these folks at any point, um, just text them in and we'll ask them. So Jeannie, do you want to do your introductions for Elder Place? Sure. So I'm Jeannie Frederick and um, I'm the Marketing and Enrollment Manager for Providence Elder Place. So I work with our intake team. Um, our screeners that we call information and referral specialists. Um, they're the folks who generally answer your phone call. And then um, the marketing team at Elder Place. And I've been here over two decades, as has Sarah. <laughs> so we're glad to be here talking with you all today. Yeah, we're long-termers. Um, so my name is Sarah Booth, and I'm the program manager for the social work department at Elder Place. And I also oversee our mental health programming. Great. Well, thank you, ladies. I appreciate it. And please, um, 
so Anne was nice and said this is kind of like a radio talk show. So um, your your insight is very valuable as this is your program. And uh, um, so please chime in whenever needed. And we will go ahead and start. And like Sue Ann said too, if you have any questions for those on the phone, um, please feel free to type them up and we will try to address those um, as we go. And we'll also have time at the end for question and answers as well. And hopefully between the four of us, we can um, help you answer those. But the key to today for me is to, to kind of get the word out to the whole state of Oregon what PACE is. I'm sure many people have heard of it. And what I hear from people is, well, I kind of know the name, but I don't know what it is. I feel, I feel kind of awkward asking because I feel like I should know. And so I'm really hoping that this um, short PowerPoint will give you the ins and outs of what the PACE program is nationally, but also what it is here in Oregon and the benefits that come along with um, a consumer or a participant um, enrolling into this PACE program. So like, um, I'm going to move to the first slide. Mm -hmm. There we go. There you go. So like Swam said, I mean, PACE mm -hmm. is the, um, the program of all-inclusive care for the elderly. And it is um, both Medicare and Medicaid national. Um, currently, unless things have changed, it's in 31 states. And it um, truly is an all-inclusive um, care for an individual in all aspects of their um, growing into the aging process. So Medicare and Medicaid funds um, cover all the medica uh, medical uh, necessary services. There is no co-pays or deductibles, and this is for everyone, I mean, whether it's Medicare or private or Medicaid. Um, Medicare recipients pay one monthly premium, and that includes the drug benefits as well. And for those who are Medicaid, um, oh, sorry, I missed one, uh, that this would also be for people who are private payers, they're not Medicare or Medicaid. And for those that are Medicaid, there might be a pay-in a state pan, um, that would be the only thing that uh, would be an extra payment for, for this kind of service. But wait till you guys hear what they get for this for this amount of money <laughs> they pay. Amount. So, and that will we get into that later too with the financials, but yeah, I know it's, it's amazing what um, one amount covers for everybody. So, PACE services. So, this is a, a list that is always growing because it doesn't really, it's not, it doesn't give benefit to everything really. But if you look at it, and I know everybody can read as well, but I, I like to say it out loud because it truly shows all of the different services that PACE provides for an individual. So it's a long-term care, their primary care, and it covers all tests and procedures, medications, prescriptions and over-the-counter, medical supplies, medical equipment, so DME equipment, um, emergency medical services, hospitals, nursing home, palliative care, which would be like end of life, adult day services, transportation, in-home care. And this program is growing as well with the state as it is with Providence Elder Place with PACE. Dental, mental health services, social services, specialty medical care. So you have your audiology, optical, and podiatry as well as all of your therapies, physical, occupational, and speech, and recreational. And so these are just the broad categories of what it covers. But if somebody is needing this, once again, with transportation, the transportation picks them up wherever their home is and brings them to whatever services are needing to go back and forth for this coverage. So as you're thinking about who might be a good candidate for um, PACE eligibility, um, keep in mind that it is um, right now a program for the elderly. So it is, um, uh, the cutoff is 55 years and older and they have to live in a PACE service area, which we'll cover in a couple of slides. Um, they have to be able to uh, reside safely with in the community. So this wouldn't be a, a good program for somebody who uh, wants to stay in home but might need uh, like a memory care 
uh, level of um, uh, safety protections. Um, and they would have to qualify for uh, a nursing facility level of care. In, in Medicaid land, we, can, we call that service priority level one through 13, but that they need um, some sort of uh, help with their um, activities of daily living on an ongoing basis. Um, can I add something to that about the, this is Jeannie from Elder Place, about the residing safely in the community. Um, the way we really interpret that is if someone is living in a nursing facility and that's really the right place for them, then at that point in time, they don't qualify to join Elder Place or if they're in the hospital. But when they reach that point that they're able to return to the community, um, then we can get engaged at that point. So we do partner with memory care for people that kind of need that level of care. Um, and when they live in their own home, uh, we try to support them there as long as possible. Um, but sometimes those in-home situations, as you know, get to a place where really they need another level. And, and if they're already in the program, then we support them moving to that next level. So just wanted to clarify that piece. Thanks, Jeannie. Sure. Um, one of the really nice things that um, if you're if you have somebody who might be considering or you think might be a nice candidate for PACE is um, just the coordination of care that happens um, uh, and the interaction with the consumer. So um, PACE is going to take over um, all of their medical. So that means their doctors. Um, they're going to have uh, regular contact with a social worker, a dietitian if they need it, um, therapies. Um, and it's, this can be really good, especially if you have families who are making the referral, um, say they're out of state and they came to visit mom over the holidays um, and are really nervous. Um, it's really nice to be able to, to reassure them that a lot of that coordination, like um, around like transportation is all going to be taken care of within the, the PACE program so their family member can have a pretty easy access to care. Um, it's also really great for consumers who might be um, a little more isolated in the community um, uh, just because of the range of services that PACE offers from the day centers um, and, uh, and access to social workers. It makes sure that people are staying engaged within their community um, and just have something to do throughout the day. Um, so it can be um, you know, really nice for, um, for people who might need that extra social contact as well. So just to clarify, can a person be living in a foster home or an assisted living and be on pace? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Jennifer, that was a great question. Yeah. So just to reiterate what, uh, what Jeannie had said, so I mean, for all levels of living safely in the community is adult foster home, assisted living, residential care, and in-home. And then also, like what Jeannie had mentioned, that you know, occasionally with the memory care, if they're just needing those services for, for the cognition part, that they could also. But if they're in a hospital and or a nursing facility, they would need to be transitioned out of both of those, both and live in the community. I believe that the uh, the state law says like 30 days, Jeannie, um, something like that. They need to be living safely in the community without the risk of going back into a nursing facility for rehab or to the hospital. And so, to live safely means that they would they are already living in a community setting. So, well, and we, I'm just going to jump in. This is Sarah. Um, you know, it, at, at time of intake or um, or thereafter, you know, I think we can do a lot of that transition back to the community because oftentimes we have a um, we have a wonderful nurse that goes into the nursing facility to, and kind of assess the person in terms of community placeability. So our intake team oftentimes will be able to make that transition in preparation for enrollment. And if we can see that it's really um, a good fit and it's the right level of care, then we can enroll immediately. And, and this piece um, is only kind of relevant, if you will, at the point they're joining the program. So once right. they're a participant in Elder Place, if they come to need the hospital or they come to need a nursing home stay, even if it's a long-term nursing home stay, they continue with the program. 
it's only at the moment they're joining that they need to be at a level of care that can be supported outside of the hospital or nursing home. So we have a question if, if you, someone, one of you guys can give us an example of someone who might be in a nursing facility but would be better off maybe in the community with the PACE program? Can you think well, of like situation? someone, for example, oh, this is Jeannie, like someone, for example, who maybe has, was living home with their spouse and they had a stroke and they went into the nursing home and now they're really at a different level of care, but they don't necessarily need to be long-term in a nursing facility. Elder Place could potentially be um, that extra support needed so that they could return back home with the spouse. They could come into our center and give that spouse respite. We could do physical therapy with them and help them hopefully, you know, gain functioning and, and have some recovery from that stroke. So that's a great example of someone that, you know, would be good to think of for elder place even while they're in the nursing home, but we can help be that plan um, in terms of going back to the community. Great, thanks. Those are great questions, so please keep them coming. And let us know, Leah, that was from you, and let us know if that answer wasn't enough for you. We'll move on to the next slide. So, um, Sarah, uh, Sarah here in the room, Sarah Bristol had mentioned, you know, the coordination of um, the team and together the team that was mentioned in the last slide, um, they do have you know, the medical, registered nurse, um, therapists, social workers, the aides, dietitians, even the transportation, anybody who is involved in the care of an individual um, is put into this Team, and it's called an IDT team and for interdisciplinary. And it truly, each person that has any contact with um, the individual over a period of any time, um, they are the care plan for this individual to make sure that they have the best interest and to keep the person um, living as safely and independently as possible during this time. And they meet bi-monthly on each individual unless there is a change of condition and they I've been privileged to be in these and it is it's amazing how much each of these um, different team members know about the person you really feel like they have the full wraparound services for for anything that might might be needed whether it was something that happened over the weekend or um, how are they doing since they're their fall and how's this assistive device working and and their dietary needs. It's it's really amazing how this team um, truly is a center point of making sure that not only the participant but the family needs are being met at the same time. So so I want to also just kind of clarify because I want to be sure people understand that we do um, full um, discipline assessments every six months. But certainly every person has an individualized care plan, and within that individualized care plan is um, maybe, you know, built in that they see the social worker weekly if they're really having some difficulty coping with an adjustment to change, let's say, or they're, like Jeannie said, maybe they're getting intensive physical therapy. So um, so the sort of the, uh, the regulatory is six months assessment, but in between that, there's lots and lots of contact with the care team. And that interdisciplinary team, everyone meets together at a minimum of once a, w once a week. We also have what we call stand-up, where kind of smaller versions of that team get together every day. So any issues that come up, we can address them in the moment. And correct me wrong, you guys are now on a live care plan, too. So anything that's in the computer system um, is updated immediately. And so um, it's not just a care plan that's reviewed now every six months. It's the, the live care plan as um, daily changes happen as well. So yeah, that, thanks for bringing that up. That's absolutely true. Yeah, so it's, it's very, the care plan should be always very current. Yes, and I, I love that new part because um, it truly is putting the first in um, every day something could be changed and it will be up to date on that. So I think that's great. Yeah. So we talked about how PACE is national and PACE in Oregon. And um, currently Providence Elder Place is our only PACE provider in Oregon. 
and the state of Oregon always supports expansion of the PACE program, um, as well as answering any questions from other providers who may be asking questions about what PACE is. And uh, so within Oregon, uh, it started in Multnomah County, and in the last, what has it been now, three years, um, the PACE program has expanded to um, four other counties. We have Classic County, parts of, or moved to Washington County first, and then parts of Clastup and Tillamook, and then most recently it has moved to parts of Clackamas. And um, Providence Elder Place with our PACE program is now serving over 1,300 participants. So it has really grown. And um, I know it gets old for some of you who, who have been through my trainings, but you know, it truly is growing enough that um, I would challenge every county to know about the PACE program, the ins and outs, and how wonderful the wraparound services are because we never know when PACE might be moving into your region, your service area. And to be able to give referrals to a different county too um, is wonderful as well as mom and dad have always lived in Bend and with the, and they're gonna be moving to Portland to live with the kids or live closer to the kids so they can take care of them. It would be really nice for the state of Oregon, especially you know, in this scenario, Bend, knowing that this benefit is existing out there um, for someone who could really benefit on that. So it's not just that these five counties need to know about PACE. Truly, the whole state of Oregon should know about what the PACE program is, but specifically in Oregon, where it's located for the service areas. Do we have any plans to move anywhere else anytime soon that we know of? Um, with Providence Elder Place being our only provider, that would be a question that they would answer, but I'm under the impression that this <laughs> Well, we don't have any tangible plans specifically. I mean, we definitely have plans to expand further into Clackamas County and probably further into Washington County, but um, Outside of that, I would say we are having conversations with other parts of the state, but nothing that's on any level definitive. Great, thank you. So with the next slide, it kind of goes into detail of what we were just talking about. And so when we say parts of Washington and parts of, um, of Clackamas, um, these are truly you know, the cities and it's more set by zip codes. So all of Multnomah County is serviced with uh, PACE or PACE services all of Multnomah County. And for Washington County, um, if those cities with those zip codes are being serviced at this time, so when Jeannie was talking about maybe it expanding, you know, the, the cities that aren't mentioned are the ones that would be potentially an area for expansion. All of Clatsop County, um, I think there is what, a whole whopping five zip codes in there. Um, and then parts of <coughs> Tillamook, with um, the, the more of the northern part of Tillamook because it's so expansive. And that was a, a neat expansion and very unique was moving to more of um, a rural setting. Um, so we're excited that um, Providence Elder Place was able to get this going so we can kind of see how the PACE program works in the rural areas. And then with Clackamas, um, remember this is our newest county. And so these are the cities um, with the zip codes that um, now reach the, the PACE service areas as well. So the question coming up is, can other providers in other parts of the state apply to become PACE providers? Absolutely. And it sounds like from what the Providence folks said, they're in conversations with other providers about becoming providers. Well, and so some of the questions that I get are from outside of Oregon providers, because if you think about it, um, to be able to, I mean, Providence, taking, just take the word elder place out, Providence Health System, I mean, they already have a very <laughs> firm foundation um, with these areas, with the different kind of um, wraparound services that they have. And so, but to be able to include the housing with it and the transportation and everything else, it truly would require um, if a different provider was to come in, a very all-inclusive, um, just a lot of building and growth unless it's already existing within. But 
um, being the state policy analyst, so we are always open to questions and ideas. Some states have, you know, five, six, seven PACE providers. Um, many states have one. So it all depends on the state makeup of what other health services are already out there and how they're contracted out. And we'll kind of talk about that later too, but Providence Elder Place contracts with many of their services as well, especially in the classic Tillamook area, we call that North Coast, because um, it is so um, spread out and they are needing to make sure they have the contracts for different, different um, services in there. So it's always open, um, you know, it would go through, it's, it's through CMS, which is our federal as well. And so it would be fun uh, make be making sure that they follow those guidelines as well as the state guidelines. And just to clarify, the conversations that we're having with other parts of the state is really with the, the at the county level or um, uh, other parts of the state where Providence already has a presence. So it would still be, if we were expanding, it would still be Providence Elder Place program, but maybe, you know, like, for example, we've had lots of conversations with Medford. Um, so whether or not that will actualize, I don't know, but we've been in dialogue with them, for example. Yeah. That Thank you. Great. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, Jennifer, I think we answered your question. It sounds like other providers can apply, but they have to be a collaboration of folks that can provide all the services that the PACE programs are um, provide to everybody. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and like in California, for example, um, which is where the original PACE program started in San Francisco, that program is called Onlock. There are now, I believe, four other mm -hmm. providers of PACE services, and they are separate entities. They're not all under one umbrella, like, you know, Providence, for example. But in many other states, and actually most other mm -hmm. states, it's sort of one provider because it's a pretty capital intensive model of care to start with. And so until you have kind of um, a breadth of po folks in the program, it can be financially, you know, pretty challenging to get started because once you're a service provider, we're responsible for all the cost of care for those participants, regardless of how much we receive for that individual that month. So. But it's definitely doable. Just to, <laughs> there's a lot of pieces to it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So with Elder Place, um, for the PACE, they have PACE centers um, or PACE health and social centers. And Elder Place currently has nine of these centers. Um, and this is where uh, the individuals would come in and they would see the doctor if they had a doctor's appointment, maybe some therapy, maybe get their medications, um, do some fun activities, um, have a, a really good lunch, um, and just kind of have, have that be their social outing um, with any kind of appointments all in one. So that way they're not having to go back and forth, back and forth all the time. They have this health and social center that they can um, attend with transportation, picking them up from their home and bringing them back and spend a couple of hours and take care of all of their needs if needed at that time. Uh, three of these centers also have housing that's attached to those. And um, we'll talk about those in a little bit as to which ones, but this is where they would just have the opportunity to participate in any kind of social activities and um, and just have their needs met at that time as well. I can't do it. That's because I oh. have a question. Sorry. Okay. There we go. So do you have a question? Yeah, we have another question. So um, somebody's asking about the, do you have solid data to show the financial savings or not for the PACE program and where could people find that? Do you guys have a website with that? So are you looking at for a state savings? Um, I would imagine because um, Providence Elder Place, they have their own financials, but that's just for them as a taste center. So would, for, this, would it be would it be a savings for an individual to be able to have all these services coordinated? Absolutely. It seems like it would be. And for the state, if you're looking I mean, for the state level, I mean, I, I work more with the Medicaid and um, having all of these wraparound services, your transportation, your your housing, 
your medical, your therapies, I mean, everything that's included in there, you need a new wheelchair because yours broke or your dentures or your eyeglasses, I mean, on and on, all of these services are provided. And like what Jeannie said, I mean, if your health um, gets you to a situation where you are no longer able to live safely in your home, whether it's an assisted living, residential care, adult foster home, or in-home, and you are now needing a higher level of care, maybe in a memory care or a nursing facility, um, your that monthly payment that is paid to Providence Elder Place includes the higher level of care needs as well. So if you're needing a nurse coming into your home, or if you're needing to have therapies three to five days a week, um, it, it, it truly, the amount doesn't change. I mean, annually we have a rate change, mm -hmm. but outside of that, that rate will always be constant for the care needs that you're needing, no matter what level of care needs you're needing. And with the, uh, they have um, people, I mean, Sarah uh, Bristol had mentioned how we call it the SPL levels, uh, one through 13. You have somebody that's a one or a three who has really <coughs> high level needs versus somebody who's 13, who maybe has a little bit of, um, I, I'm gonna do it wrong, because I don't do these, but cognition, I mean, I think cognition lo lowers them down. Yeah. So, so the yeah, these medications and stuff. So yeah. you have such a wide level of care needs in there, and um, everyone pays the same amount on that. Now, so, um, can, this is Jeannie, can I just add something to that? Please do. I was going to ask you guys if you, as you do intake, do you talk to people about the savings and things like that? Well, so the first thing I want to share with you all is that 98% of the people who are in our program are Medicaid eligible. So most people that we serve aren't actually paying anything directly to Elder Place. So these are already folks who are low income and qualify for Medicaid services. And then the state pays Elder Place a capitated payment each month, so a fixed amount. And then we also get a capitated payment from Medicare for that person. Um, and then we're responsible for all the cost of their care. So if we kind of the financially, the concept behind the PACE model is, you know, if we get a fixed amount from each person in our program, at any given in time, we might be spending, you know, 20 times that on one person, but spread across a whole group of people, maybe we're spending a little bit less than we're getting on other people that month. And that's how we sort of balance the cost financially. The other way we do it is that we're an incredibly staff intensive model. So we have like 1,350 participants and we have about 450 staff. So um, we see the folks in our program really often and we see them for longer periods of time, I guess is one way to say it, than typically happens in the community. So we're really able to be preventative. And the good thing about that, of course, is that's good quality of care, but it also is financially beneficial because if we can prevent a hospitalization or we can prevent a, a skilled nursing stay um, by having our home care nurse go out and you know kind of catch something before it turns into something bigger, then we've provided good care and um, been financially good stewards. So that's how the PACE model functions. We do have about 2% of the people who aren't financially eligible for Medicaid that pay us privately the same amount we would get from Medicaid. Um, so there's no, you know, for us, there's no difference in terms of how much we receive if they pay privately or not. Um, but just to put that kind of, hopefully that explains a little bit more how the model is designed to work financially. Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. And also, Jeannie, just to back up a little bit more in there is that, um, the, the ratio, you had mentioned, you know, how many staff, but also for people, you know, like for me, when I go see my, my primary care, um, the ratio of how many patients they see versus what your ratio is uh, per uh, physician is amazing as well. And so, yeah, they truly do see um, these, these individuals more often or maybe not more often, but less, and so they are able to have more time to spend with each of these individuals as well. Yeah, I, I think most community physicians have about two to 3,000 on their panel, and our physicians have 116. So it's 
drastically different. So they really are able to spend a lot more time per participant. And the quality of those interactions can be things that um, are really helpful to older, ad older adults in terms like advanced care planning, goals of care planning. So that all of those conversations that can really help promote the person having um, information and make choices that really are the best quality of life for that person. So I think that's um, something that maybe in the community is not always um, it's a kind of a luxury for uh, a patient to be able to sit down with their primary care provider and actually discuss kind of what's most important about my care and, and going forward, what do I want in terms of advanced directives? So I think that's sort of that, that extra time that our providers have. Yes, great. <laughs> so now the obvious question that just came in is, okay, so what is the rate if somebody has to pay privately? So it's the same as the Medicaid rate. So what would what would an estimate or so when figure? someone pays privately, they pay the Medicaid rate as well as a Part D premium, which is about forty six hundred dollars a month. Um, and as Cindy Susie mentioned, that amount only changes if Medicaid or Medicare, I guess Part D changes the rate that that they pay us. Um, but included in that is not only, you know, all their medical care, all their medications, all their equipment, all their supplies, all their specialists, all their transportation, you know, all those pieces, but also the cost of care either for those in-home caregivers if they live in their in-home or the cost of services if they live in a facility or an adult care home. So we're responsible um, for all of those costs each month. <laughs> And the, coordinate, and the coordination with the housing as well. And so just because this person lives in an assisted living doesn't mean the assisted living does their thing and <laughs> Elder Place does their thing. They work collaborative to make sure that when the individual is at home, that the same care plan is being followed through as well. So the coordination, I think, is a, a huge part, too, that money can't really buy. Um, and something like this. And just a little bit of a perspective, uh, at least in the, the Portland metro area, um, a private pay adult foster home can easily run uh, $4,000 a month private pay without any health insurance at all attached to it. Um, just, just the long-term care in that house. So um, it can be very cost effective if the consumer needs to be um, in that a little bit higher level of care. Well, and since I also set the nursing facility rates for Medicaid, I can tell you that if an individual is needing um, Medicaid, but if they're needing nursing facility level of care, um, just basic care is about $8,000 a month. So for this $4,600, if some, if a participant was in, for the state Medicaid right now, we're, we're right about 4,300 because we don't, we have the, the medication off the site, but so it truly, if somebody is needing a, a skilled stay, um, the cost, the cost effectiveness is, is absolutely um, beneficial. Does that answer the question? <laughs> it does, but um, she's now asking, um, she's curious why more private pay consumers aren't choosing this option, especially folks in you know, foster homes or assisted livings where they may already be paying, you know, why wouldn't more, why isn't it more out there in the main market? Well, just out of curiosity. There's, there's a couple of a couple of things. I'm sure Jeannie's going to want to chime in with her perspective <laughs> as well. Um, I think, A, it's just not um, that well-known of a program. Um, people don't, people don't know that it's an option. Um, but also part of, I mean, it's, it's the flip side of the coin of when you get all of these uh, wraparound services and um, Providence Elder Place is providing all of your medical. Um, that means that they're providing all of your medical. So if you you have you know a doctor that you've had um, for for 20 years, um, part of the the choice of joining Pace is you may have to give up that doctor um, or um, you know, other care provider that maybe you'd had in the past. Um, so that can definitely I think be a challenge for some people to make that choice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And I think, you know, sometimes it's just like, even if joining the program would only cost um, the client, 
you know, sort of visually, if you will, a few more hundred dollars a month. Um, sometimes it's hard when it's the person's funds for the family to feel like they want to spend down to Medicaid even two months sooner by joining Elder Place. I mean, I was talking with a daughter just recently who um, enrolled with us. She she heard about us while her mom was still private pay, but she didn't choose to enroll until she went on Medicaid. And then I talked with her, you know, probably nine months after that and said, if you had understood better everything that Elder Place offers, would you have enrolled her as private pay? And she said, absolutely. But at the time, the thought of, you know, mom spending down to Medicaid even a few months earlier didn't feel right. So I think it's kind of a little bit, that's a barrier sometimes when folks are privately paying. Absolutely. Um, and then, so the participants still have to pay their own housing and utilities if they're not in the housing portion of elder of uh, elder place, so they, well, they pay, pay rent and meal. They pay room and board. They don't pay for any of the we care pay, in their home. We pay the larger amount, which is what the actual service delivery, the right. hands-on care part of it. So, like the Medicaid room and board is five seventy-one. So a private pay person might still only pay that much room and board in a facility, um, but it depends on the facility. They might ask for a higher room and board than them. But if they're living in their home but participating in Elder Place, then they would pay their own housing and utility, but everything yeah. else would be covered by you. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. correct. Cool. So these guys are definitely thinking about referring people because they're asking you nitty gritty questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So moving with the next slide, we're, we're, we've kind of covered some of these, but you know, with three housing locations. So I mentioned before that Elder Place has um, their own, they have two RCS and one ALF. Um, these are in Multnomah County. And um, Elder Place contracts with all the other housing types. And we've mentioned those before as well. So that should just be the same kind of things. And then also that um, Elder Place can also provide in-home services through contracted in-home agencies. I see one acronym that I'm not familiar with. What's CCHP? Congregate Housing Program. Thank you. And I didn't know it either. That's why I love it. She <laughs> <laughs> just updated it yesterday. <laughs> so, Thank you. So. Mm -hmm. so we kind of talked about this. Um, we'll just cover a little bit more. Maybe this will be new. So. Um, once again, the amount is the same no matter what kind of payer the individual is with Medicare, private, or Medicaid. It's the same monthly cost, and I um, am a big fan of that, that there's no, um, because you're a private pay, you're going to pay more, and um, we're going to make sure that you are compensating for the Medicaid cost. <laughs> there is no differential between what your payer source is um, it's always the same and um, like Jeannie said 98% enrollees are Medicaid in this um, situation but it doesn't mean that I think Sarah Bristol hit it spot on too I mean we're just trying to get um, the word of what PACE is statewide so there can be more referrals to the program instead of just um, case managers um, who in our local offices, I mean, they are trained to know what PACE is, especially since the expansion over the next, uh, the last four counties. However, we need to make sure that um, other partners outside of the state agency also, um, I guess, have this special gift of knowledge of that there is another benefit option out there for all individuals, Medicaid, private, or Medicare. Um, and once again, the monthly amount covers all cost of care, all cost of care. Um, and once again, if you're if they're Medicaid consumers, they may have a state pay-in that would be paid to the state. Um, that would be their liability um, if they're over a certain amount. And that would, you know, mm -hmm. we can get into great nitty-gritty detail on that. But ultimately, <laughs> it's a it's, sliding scale that's just, sort of based on your living situation. So it's just a small amount um, on some. And if, um, there's other, if there's no other resources available, Elder Place could um, become a rep payee 
if um, if there's situations where family members or the individual themselves aren't able to do their financials, there is a way that we could potentially get that set up um, with Elder Place being a rep payee for their finances. So referrals, that's what we were just talking about. Um, you know, anybody can give a referral and um, here's the numbers. There's Multnomah, Washington, Clackamas. That would be the 503-215 number. And if they're in Tillamook, class of area, then it we refer to that North Coast. That would be the number for intake for there as well. And this is not an inclusive list of who can refer. Um, this is usually done uh, with the local offices. And so anybody can be a referral. And so right now with getting this information out um, with this webinar, uh, we are asking that you keep that in mind as well. If you have someone that you think would benefit from this wraparound service program, um, especially if, like I said, if there's a, a move um, or a transition with a living situation, maybe they don't have the family support in this area, or just the social. I know personally the socializing is very important to me and my, my aging loved ones, and I would never want to have somebody feel like they can't go anywhere because they're tied at home. And in this case, um, they would have the opportunity to have transportation pick them up as well as drop them back off while they were able to have a couple of hours of nice social entertainment to go with that as well. So, and speaking from experience as well, we have the, the population that's out there that, especially these private pay, somebody asked, why aren't they? Well, private pay have worked really hard for I think saving for the future, and I think it's hard for them to think of paying any kind of additional money because I might need that money. <laughs> and um, yeah, so you need you you don't have transportation anymore. So, but I'm not paying that eighty dollars so I can get somebody to take me to the senior center. Well, that's included in the pace um, wraparound services. I'm not. I'm not paying to go to the adult day center that they charge too much. Well, you get to go to the PACE um, social center and have that kind of um, time to, to work with people and also get a nutritious meal, see your doctor. You don't have to worry about waiting for another transportation system and making those calls. Elder Place does all of that calls for the transportation themselves and it's a neat idea for those who maybe are a little bit more of the penny pinchers that are isolating themselves instead of having the, the opportunity to actually get more involved in the community. Well, and the options counselors are trained to talk to people about the saving for a rainy day and how this might be the rainy day or at least mm -hmm. the beginning of the rainy day. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're trained to talk to people in that way to help them begin to look at, you know, what their situation is. That's good. Yeah, because we have some, I mean, I, I have one of those. It's like, I don't want to pay that. Yeah, but you're stuck. Um, so <laughs> it's a it's a it's a win-win situation on this. And when you're making referrals, it's, um, you know, if you don't remember all of the details of, of some of the things that are offered that we're talking about, um, when you make that referral, you're not just initially signing them up. Um, Elder Place will um, go out and uh, you know, interview the consumer and go over all of this with them and make sure that they really understand, you know, specifically what they're signing up for, what they're going to get um, in exchange for moving to the PACE program, what they might have to give up. Um, so it'll be made really, really clear to the consumer. Um, so if you get a little fuzzy on some of the details, um, it's okay. You know, certainly those, um, those intake workers uh, at, at PACE are going to cover that. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. That's very true. I mean, it's totally the participant's choice to join the program. And um, most people in Elder Place stay with us through end of life, but it is also always the participant's choice if for some reason they are unhappy or something else changes in their life, that being in the program doesn't work anymore, they can always choose to disenroll. So it might feel like they're sending their life away because they're choosing a whole package, but they're really not. So. And Jeannie, I think you brought up a good point on that too. I mean, it's always the individual's choice. Um, once they sign in, they're not 
signing their life away. I mean, they, they have the right to still um, disenroll at any time. And I think sometimes people think of it as, you know, once you sign in, you're in forever because it, it does have the full spectrum of um, wraparound services, but, you know, they could choose to, uh, you know, I, I really liked Dr. Young and I, I want to go back to him. You know, that there are situations where that may, you know, come up and they do have that, that right as well. But most of the time, I think once people get in there and they see everything, they, they stay for a very long time. And so what better way than if people stay for a long time and, um, and like with you, Jeannie and Sarah on the phone, I mean, you've been with Elder Place for so long. I mean, not only is there the, the continuity of people and the longevity, but also we work really hard with the, the collaboration. And, and this is one of the things that I really enjoyed being in this new role the last couple of years is the, the collaboration and communication. And so Providence Elder Place may be our one and only provider right now. Um, and I'm the, the liaison and then we have people like Sarah who are actually more in the field with doing the QA and the, the case working. We all work together and we all communicate together. We're all in this together for the greater good and that is for enhancing the life of the individuals that are out there in aging and to make this aging um, a, better, a better time and not a scary time, but to, to communicate and to work together. And so I love the fact that we all have the same, the same goal of making sure that we're looking out for Oregon's aging population. Can I ask Sarah, the QA person, Sarah? <laughs> um, QA oftentimes, you know, is looking at data and, and analyzing the data, and then you're also doing training kinds of things. So is there anything that you can share with the folks who are gonna be sending the consumers you know, to this program about the training or the data that you're seeing that would be helpful for them? Um, yeah, and well, I think one of the, one of the things is uh, something that Jeannie touched on um, a little bit that once people enroll in this program, they do tend to stay with it um, uh, sort of, you know, through the end of life. Um, uh, and I do think that, um, you know, from the Medicaid perspective, I know that, um, and, and this sort of sounds awful, but it's, it can be really challenging to place um, consumers and oftentimes adult foster homes um, uh, who find out that it's the, consumer is a PACE consumer, um, it sort of sweetens the deal and they might be more likely to, uh, to take them um, just because they know that um, uh, that consumer is, is never going to be sort of um, left in the lurch in terms of um, getting the sort of care that they need. Um, so that's definitely like when I'm doing trainings to um, our Medicaid case managers, you know, I, I definitely tell them about how it, it can make Sort of managing that caseload easier just because uh, quite frankly pace consumers are are easier because providence elder place does so much of the work for us yeah thank you and looking at it from the private perspective too that you don't have a case manager which is medicaid if you're private paid but if you're looking at for loved ones um, the social workers within providence elder place um, they are that case manager that um, normally a private a individual would not have and so it is still you have the, the wraparound with the, the continuity of care through there too. Great thanks so much. So contacts um, and Jeannie and I don't have your information <laughs> on there so if you would love to, to say yours as well it's up to you. Um, <laughs> But um, right now, I am the, the, the one and only PACE policy analyst for the state. And there's my number and my email <laughs> and the toll-free number, which also is attached to my phone. Email is best. So if you are on this training and you have questions for me, um, emailing uh, tends to, to get to me a little bit quicker. Um, and then for Providence Elder Place, once again, the two referral numbers. And um, looks like there is a web link there as well. And then if you're interested in a little bit more with a PACE overview for the Medicare, um, and also 
for CMS, our Centers for Medicaid or Medicare and Medicaid, um, some fact sheets. And so it is a federal uh, program as well. So there's a lot of information on there. So that what we're telling you about is more Oregon specific, but there is so much more out there too that shows that this is not just a small program that Oregon has kind of made up. Um, this is national. And then also the National Peace Association um, could also have the, with the web link there, could give you more information if you're looking on it too. Thank you. Jeannie and Sarah, I don't know if you guys want, want to give any phone number or email address, but um, if you don't, then people on the, on the webinar can just get hold of me or Cindy and we can help, you know, connect you with other folks. Well, what I was going to say is that referral line actually rings right here at our building. So you can call that 315-6556 and ask for me or Sarah and Perfect. they'll take awesome. So thank you. thank you. So we've been covering some questions, but you know, we have plenty of time and this would be any curiosity questions. If you want us to explain a little bit more, maybe we went too quickly on something or we weren't very clear. Um, we are always open for questions because I see it as the more questions we have, the more we're getting the word out there on what PACE is. So, so I have something I just wanted to share. This, this might sound fabricated, but it's honestly just a coincidence of time, timing. But yesterday afternoon, I um, participated in a focus group with six of our Elder Place participants and three family members at our Elder Place and Gresham site. And one of the questions we asked them was sort of like, you know, what do they, you know, how do they feel about Elder Place? What do they like? What do they not like? And I came back, if you will, with all these, what I think of as warm fuzzies. So someone working here was just really, just felt so good to hear um, straight from the people we serve mouths, if you will, how they experience us. And so I just thought I might share a few of them if y'all are interested. Um, so one great. of the, okay, so one of the participants said um, that they appreciate the medical team. When something serious came up, they all helped me get through the crisis. Anytime anything comes up, there's immediate action. Um, other folks said, you know, they listen, that each person and each problem they take separately and serve it as it individually needs. Um, that um, it's not just here at the center, but they also come to your home. They're right on it. The same day we had everything we needed, the whole nine yards. Phenomenal people, um, information and support, everybody cares. Um, one participant talked about how financially it was really easy for her. Everything is taken care of. Um, they're really on top of it. They don't make you feel like you're costing too much money. <laughs> um, coordinated care. I have all their phone numbers. They always call back. Um, we have a whole team. I'm not all by myself. They help me manage it. Um, so I could kind of go on, but it was just really like – what we want people to be experiencing. Um, you can see them deliberately slow down and spend time with you. I think it's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great that you, it's, a good, it's good to know that you do um, focus groups with folks. Uh, we do, at the ADRC, we do consumer satisfaction surveys and we ask questions like that, but it's awesome to do the focus groups where people are facing you. Um, we have a question, um, we have a couple questions, actually. Looks like a couple have come in. Um, so if someone is a vet, can they receive PACE services? A veteran? They can. Mm -hmm. So what we usually tell them is that when, when someone's a veteran, you know, they're eligible for VA for life. But when they join Elder Place, they basically just don't use it. They don't need the VA because we become their primary care provider and we provide all the services they would have gotten through the VA. Okay. Um, and then there's another question, just to clear up if they are in assisted living, then they would pay the, the money to the assisted living for that, and then they would pay the pay fee 
on top of that, or Medicaid would, or private pay they would? So if they're Medicaid, they're going to be um, uh, they're they're going to be financially under the same treated the same as any other Medicaid consumer. So they would pay their room and board to the facility, mm -hmm. and then whatever their liability was based on their income. Mm -hmm. So they and wouldn't necessarily. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, Elder Place pays for the cost of services. So we contract with assisted living facilities. The client still is responsible for their room and board. Great. Thank you. Um, and then another question is, how do you coordinate with hospice for end-of-life care? Um, the, the person is saying that it seems like there's some similarities. Um, yeah, this is, this is Sarah. I'm going to answer this. Um, we have a palliative care program, and it serves people through the spectrum of um, those very early on decisions about what's most important about their medical care. So that may be that may be years over time where they want some interventions, but not all interventions. So it's a very individualized care plan. And then there's the second stage of our palliative care program that is more like a hospice, and it provides all the services that hospice would provide. And then the last stage is when it's um, the person is actively dying and all our care team services are delivered in the home. And there's a lot of support to whoever the caregiver is and to the family. And then we also have um, some bereavement follow-up. So, um, so on a very limited amount, we contract some with hospice services for some of the overnight care that we maybe don't always have available. So if somebody, if we're kind of concerned that somebody may need some symptom management in the middle of the night and we don't have a nurse to go out, we contract with hospice for that kind of service. We do have our primary care providers on call 24 seven, however, so they are always able to respond to a nursing visit if medications are needed to be ordered or, or, other, um, or other interventions. So someone can't be enrolled in hospice and PACE at the same time. So we provide those services via our PACE program is what Sarah's Thank you. Sharing. That was much simpler. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you gave more <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, we'll give another couple of minutes here. Is there anything <clears throat> that any of you four would like to say sort of in a wrap-up way? Um. Well, I guess, um, I mean, we've, we've touched on this, but, you know, most of the folks who join our program come to our health and social center um, every week, and that health and social center is also where the whole interdisciplinary team is and the medical clinic. But it is certainly fine for someone to choose our program and not want to come into the center. Maybe they only come once a month, or maybe they only come when they have a doctor's appointment. Um, and then there are other folks where coming into the center just doesn't work for them because maybe they have advanced dementia and the bus ride is agitating or the day center is too stimulating, or maybe they're at a point in their medical health that, you know, traveling even a few miles, you know, physically is untenable, then we provide all of these same services, but we deliver them to the home. So our nurses, our physicians, our social workers, our rehab staff, the whole team um, will bring the care to where the, the person is. Wow, thank you. That was important to know. I'm not I'm not seeing any other questions, so to me that means you guys have done a good job of explaining. Um, it's it's really exciting that this program is there, and I'm really glad to know more about it because I've heard about it for years. Um, and I we will post this on the website. We have been recording it, so we will post it, and um, folks can. It's the State Unit on Aging web website, and it's the training page. And the webinars are right at the top of the page, and this will be the newest webinar, so it will be right at the top of the page. Um, and so as soon as we can get it closed captioned, we'll put it up there. So I don't still, I still don't see any other questions. So unless one of you speakers has something else to say, and I'm not, I'm seeing head shakes from this angle. <laughs> Jeannie and Sarah? No, I don't think else? so. 
Yeah, thank you. So thank you very much. Yeah, I want to thank all of you for being on here today. It's been great. Um, I want to remind the folks in the audience uh, out there that we do have one more this year in November. It's the second Wednesday, which I can't remember what the date is, but it's the second Wednesday in November in the afternoon, and the topic will be best practices for working with folks who are deaf and hard of hearing. So I'm excited about that one and learning about that too. Um, so thanks, guys. Keep an eye open for that web that um, email from Lori. Thanks, Jennifer. November 8th is the date. <laughs> Put it on your calendar. We'll get the registration out. Appreciate those of you who've been on here, and have a great afternoon. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Okay, Bye-bye.